Projeco TV6 presents Six in the City. And now, here they are, those merry men of mirth, those icons of entertainment, the champagne of cable television, Canada Zone, John and Dave. Welcome, welcome my friends to Six in the City. It's been so long, we haven't seen you since last time. Welcome. Uh, on a serious note, every once in a while, Dave Paul and John Hollingsworth sit down and reflect on the valuable celebrities that pass, th pass through our hallowed halls. Um, and sometimes are not as zany and crazy as guys like Dave Burgess and Sarah Woodley but they're still very important. And when they come to Sarnia, they have to come to Six in the City. Absolutely, I think it shows our diversity, that we can be crazy, but every once in a while we can have a real serious conversation with somebody. We have mass appeal. Oh, we have mass anyway, I know that. <laughs> we have girth. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week was one of those times when Barbara Coloroso, famous speaker, popular author, and uh, what else? Former we, guest on Oprah. Former guest on Oprah. A bunch of talk shows, radio talk shows across Canada. She was almost on Letterman. She was almost on Leno. And now you're getting silly, but she really has appeared on I Oprah. I was getting silly. Was, yeah. Sorry. Um, anyway, she was in Sarnia. They do uh, the Oprah. That's the circuit. Oprah, Six in the City. Hopefully we'll it's known get all as, the others. It's known as dude, no, <laughs> the circuit. The circuit. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you digress. Um, we did have uh, Ms. Coloroso on our show, and uh, we did an interview. And right now, instead of all the claptrap, instead of the top six and the banter and the frivolity that usually ensues, we're going to cut right to her interview because, really, I don't think we could really get a word in edgewise. She just went to town, didn't she? It was, <laughs> it was one of those great interviews where we didn't need to do any interviewing. So uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to cut right over to our interview earlier with uh, Barbara Coloroso. Please stay tuned. If you're like many Canadians, you eat out more than four times a week. Look for the Eat Smart logo. Eat Smart restaurants offer you exceptional standards in food safety, more non-smoking seating, and healthy food choices. For information on local Eat Smart restaurants, call the health unit or visit our website. It's a thrill for me, Dave Broadfoot, to be sitting here in the studio of Kojiko in this magnificent city of Sarnia, which some think of as the gateway to Point Edwards. Hey, we're back. We're back, and as we promised, we have a very special guest for you. Popular speaker, infamous author, Barbara Coloroso. Barb? It's a pleasure to be here. We are so happy to have you here. Okay. You, uh, you're quite a busy lady. Um, I love my work. Yeah. I've done it. I, I'm passionate about it. I, uh, traveling's the pits, but my work is something I, I love to do. Now, just for uh, for our audience, just to set the uh, set the stage, you are, uh, as I said, a popular speaker. You speak on uh, parenting, raising kids, conflict resolution, school, teaching, discipline, nonviolence. Um, uh, you name it at this point. <laughs> if it relates to kids or school, I've probably been involved in some way. And you've written some books. I have. Uh, my first has been out uh, for, and that's the old one. This is edition. the old one. That's the old edition, but you can hold that up if <laughs> there you like. There we go. Because a, a lot of people wouldn't know that. I revised it. Well, I can give me time to speak about that then. Um, kids are worth it. That's the basics. Mealtime, bedtime chores, sibling rivalry. Potty training, getting your kid out of the local jail. You know, the basics. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, parenting, it can happen to anybody. But the, so it's for, from birth through the teen years. Um, but I revised that. I didn't change my mind. I just oh, okay. Added, you didn't recant anything. No, no. I just added a, an additional 100 pages on bribes and threats and rewards and punishments and how those get in the way of teaching kids to act with integrity, civility, and compassion. You know those catch and being good programs? Mm. You know, teacher, did you notice? Teacher, did you see? I hugged him after I hit him. Doesn't that count? <laughs> you know. So this, this was your first book. Yes. And, and we have a tiny um, copy of this yes, for, right. um, for small people. And it was an international bestseller. Yes, it was. It now, still is. 22 countries, yeah. 22 it, languages. Now, there was three tenants. I saw a, a video presentation um, probably 15 years ago, 10 years ago, sometime. I'm afraid it's 15. Maybe 15 <laughs> years ago. And you had three things. If, if, 
if your kid comes up to you and says, Mom, can I do this? There was, there was three questions you ask yourself. What are those questions? Yes. Is it life-threatening? Is it morally threatening? Is it unhealthy? If it's none of those, allow your kid to experience the consequence for a choice he or she made. Um, if it's life-threatening, morally threatening, or unhealthy, you must intervene as a wise and caring parent. Okay. I mean, kids are going to grow up, but are we raising them? Sure. Um, and if we're raising them, we're giving them limits and boundaries, but we're also giving them an opportunity to make choices, decisions, and mistakes. And when you give them the opportunity to make those three, okay. it's important that they experience the consequences for the choices. But you're not going to say, uh, look, if you run out in the street, you'll get hit. Johnny, go show them. You know? <laughs> you're going to stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, now, is that, just if I may interject for a moment. Yeah. Is that oh, old, hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Dave. <laughs> Good to, to uh, I snuck in on the, on yeah. the couch here when you weren't looking. Um, is, there a, is there an opportunity maybe for a parent to describe consequences and say, are you sure you want to do that, even if it's not life-threatening? I wouldn't say, are you sure? I said, let's talk about what the implications would be. I'm just thinking if, I, a, if a child is going to break his toy, if he tries to, I don't know, run it over a, 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 a dangerous area. Not a dangerous area, but a, a damaging area or I something I said, oh, like bummer. Oh, bummer. <laughs> but no, I, the, you brought out a point. It's important that we model and teach, uh, that we model good behavior that we'd like kids to mimic but we also teach them so we can say to a kid um, it doesn't mean you can't say stop before they actually destroy a toy I don't want them into destructing because they'll learn things. the lesson that the yeah, toy will they, break but I don't know if yeah, it's, it's, a, it's like you don't you, you don't teach a kid a lesson by letting the cat die yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there is a time to say stop you need to put the toy back in here I'm not gonna let kids abuse things yeah that's not healthy either but if you know if I, I'm going to say to them uh, you know, you're going to learn to ride a two-wheeler and you're going to fall and there'll be scrapes. I have a daughter who's a stunt woman in Hollywood. Wow. I mean, she leaps off cliffs and gets set on fire. Um, and so I, I, you know, when she was two, she was leaping off things too. Yeah. But now she does it with care. And, and she and, gets paid for it. Yes. Well, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but uh, she was a risk taker. But there are certain risks she couldn't take. But I also, you brought up a thing about destroying a toy. And I want kids to understand that you don't destroy things either. That's not a part of those three tenets, but there's another principle in, in parenting as well. Uh, not purposely destroy them. Now, if you take your bike down the hill and you're learning to ride it and you fall and crash, it's, it, hey, bummer. It, you know, it's, it, and let's pick you up and let's sure. solve the problems that came with that. Um, but no, I don't want my kid to be destructive either. Hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of lessons. There's limits and boundaries. There's yes. limits and boundaries. Now, what about things like uh, like chores for the kids? You'd like to get them uh, to make their beds or pick up their clothes. Chores are an important thing in our lives. I call it the big C and the three R's, and the, you have to balance it. The big C are chores, and the three R's are rest, recreation, and rebellion. We need all four of those to be a healthy individual. We need rebellion? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, to stand up for a value against an injustice, to be willing to speak out when the burden's heavy. Excellent. Uh, that kind of thing. Okay. That's the kind of rebellion I want kids to okay. do. Okay. And let them rebel in the little way, things, like wearing the Superman cape over your snowsuit and over your swimming suit 24-7 for a year. It's not a bad thing if that's <laughs> what they want to do. I let them rebel in that you. way. <laughs> he told me. <laughs> well, if you, you see, I want kids um, to rebel in the little things. They rarely take the quantum leap into serious rebellion in the teen years because it's hard to rebel against your own decision. So if you let them make a lot of those decisions. Um, and so chores, back to chores. Back to chores, the big C. I want kids to understand you are an important, responsible member of the family. We're counting on you to do chores. And you start chores when it's least efficient for you. When the kid wants to do it. About <laughs> age two, they oh, want to do everything. <laughs> yeah. So at age two, you get to help make your bed. And it takes so long if there's a little oh, two-year-old oh. there. <laughs> but you know what? Bummer, Parenting right? is not an efficient profession. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> it takes a lot of time to parent. <laughs> and I'm not talking that quality time you read about in the magazines, you yep. know, where you say, kids, we're going to take a day off and go to the Toronto Zoo. Can I say that here in Sarnia? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go to the yeah. Toronto Zoo. And the kids, I don't want to go to the zoo. That's a long drive. We say, you're going to the zoo and you're going to have a good time. And no, yeah. you cannot invite your friends. <laughs> this is quality time with your parents. We're going to bond. Have you ever seen people do that and be miserable? Shut up, kid. We're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how much money this fun has well, cost us? It's usually the three-hour car ride there that... <laughs> yeah, and then we say, the worst I've ever heard is, shut up, kid, we're praying. Oh, my, <laughs> what a prayerful environment we have yes. created for kids. Uh, but back to the chores. <laughs> um, I want them to understand that I'm counting on them to do chores. Okay. And that this is nothing you get little goodies for. So I don't bribe 
or threaten or reward. No pay, uh, no allowance? Mm, or? Yeah, they get an allowance, they but not allowance. for chores. Is the allowance tied to the chores nope. at all? You just I want my children to understand they have to learn to spend money, save money, and give to those who have less than you have, which is the three things you and I have to learn to do with our money. Sure. So mm -hmm. I want them to practice it young. So the, yes, I get an allowance for one reason. You have to learn to handle money. Mm -hmm. But it's not attached to chores. And people will say, but in the real world, we get paid. I don't get paid for everything I do. I'm here. <laughs> So are we. <laughs> so, so, in fact, are we. <laughs> uh, now apparently our check is in the mail, so perhaps yeah, but, yours is But, too. I mean, there's a lot of things in life we sure. do that we don't get an external reward for. Well, especially within but the bounds of the family. It. Oh, of course. I mean, we, mom and dad don't get paid for making supper or, you know, cleaning up or anything. That's yeah. just something And you do. say, well, this is practice. Well, they'll practice out in the real world soon enough. Mm. Uh, let them hire out to the neighbors for pay. Sure. But I also want him to know that that elderly man or woman down the street, uh, even though you get paid for shoveling snow, this, they're on a tight budget. And there's a time you do it because it's the right thing to do. There's a time for generosity and mercy. And exactly. And if I want to raise my kids to act with integrity, civility, and compassion, they need to know that sometimes you do the right thing when the burden's heavy. Sometimes you don't get an external reward for something. A lot of times you don't. In fact, sometimes you'll get punished mm -hmm. for doing the right thing. And so I want to stay away from bribes and threats. Sure. It really interferes with kids acting with integrity. To be able, when their friends say, look at that person over there, a different skin color, different religion, gender, or physical or mental ability, let's go mess him up. If you've raised your kid to act with integrity, civility, and compassion, you've given them the opportunity to make choices and decisions and mistakes that weren't life-threatening or morally threatening or unhealthy, you have a better crack at your kid saying, no. I'm not going to mess that, him up. Hey, back off of him. Leave him alone. Yeah. Even when the burden's heavy, when his friends say, what are you, chicken? What are you, just like him? Which counts like for the him? rebellion part, right? Yeah. Excellent. Exactly. You yeah. got it all. And that's the part of the newest book, The Bully, the Bullied, and the Bystander. We've got to get that in there. Okay, we'll, um, get, we'll, we'll, but that's, we'll get to that. But you see how it all flows when you start letting kids make choices and decisions that they're they're their own person, and if they're, own, they're their own person, they won't be easily led by their peers. And they will be able to say, back off, leave him alone. That hurt, I wouldn't hurt him. Sure. And then his friends say, what are you, chicken? What are you, just like him? You know you have such a strong sense of self that you can stand up to that kind of peer pressure when it's the right thing to do. And believe me, there is no payoff for that other than the sense of doing the right thing. Yeah, you did the right thing. Now, do you ever get people that stand up uh, in your presentation or that write you letters and say, you know what, I don't agree with anything you said? Or Oh, especially those who are into corporal punishment. Don't you ever hit your brother anymore. <laughs> I always marvel when I see a parent of a five-year-old going, don't you ever hit your brother anymore, because what does that say? If you're bigger, you can hit. Hmm. Or find somebody smaller, which, by the way, is exactly what he did. A younger brother, younger sister, cat, dog, or whatever I think. Do I believe in discipline? Yes, but not punishment. And there's a world of difference. Um, Punishment's adult-oriented. It's imposed from without. It's something I do to a child. It often arouses resentment and basically teaches kids to respond with three Fs, out of fear, fight back, or flee. Into themselves, so afraid to make a mistake, or out the front door when they're teenagers. But discipline, if you go back to its Latin roots, I can do Latin too. <laughs> show them, I'm a former <laughs> nun here. Yeah. Show them what they've done wrong, give them ownership of the problem, give them ways to solve it, leave their dignity intact. Um, and kids need to be disciplined in three situations when they've made a mistake, when they create mischief, or when they do mayhem. And bullying, by the way, is always mayhem. And you say, well, why does a kid need to be disciplined when they make a mistake? Well, because you're probably thinking about punishment. They don't need to be punished when they make a mistake. But give, discipline, if it's giving life to learning, then when a c child has made a mistake, they need to own it, fix it, and learn from it. Uh, may I ask another question? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, you can. I can. I'd like to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> she, she's going to town here. She, she's awesome. Uh, is it possible, though, that, that families today, maybe particularly today, I guess, because they're busy, maybe can't subscribe to this kind of thing as oh. much? And a large family, even less so, because you might have to... Uh, have, you might have three or four that have misbehaved or something like that. Oh, that's it, it's why really it, hard, isn't it, to, it's hard. To, to sit down and explain to everyone what you did wrong and no, each no, time? No, 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 I'm not explaining to them. You're right, it'll take a lot of time. But, but let me first get into parenting is not an efficient profession. It will take time. They're going to grow up. Are we going to be spending the time raising them? But let's look, at, let's look at a mistake. A kid makes a mistake. The three-year-old's got to have the glass because the baby has the plastic glass. So we can talk numbers here. Okay. <laughs> um, it crashes on the floor. Now, there are three kinds of families. The brick wall, the jellyfish, and the backbone. 
the brick wall parent says, you klutzy kid, I swear you're going to use plastic the next 30 years of your life, which says <laughs> when you have a problem, you are a problem. And those are kids you're going to see hiding their problems hmm. because mistakes are bad. Hmm. The jellyfish parent, oh, kid, please, I'm so sorry I gave you a slippery glass. Oh, please, did that scare you? Now, come on over here and have some chocolate milk while I clean that up, which says when you have a problem with somebody else's fault, then I get your kid in school. And he said, wasn't my fault. Worksheet wasn't dark enough. Teacher didn't give me enough time. The kid behind me was bugging me. Or the classic, you don't understand, teacher. He hit me back first. <laughs> um, then we have the backbone parent. The backbone parent. You see, the backbone parent is like a real backbone. Gives you flexibility you don't get from a rigid brick wall, but also gives you some structure you don't get from a jellyfish. And looks at that little one and says, you have a problem, go get me a bag. Three-year-olds can't pick up glass, but they can hold a bag. Mm -hmm. You put the glass in, they help mop the floor up, and then you say, which of these two plastic glasses would you like to use today? Mm -hmm. Which says, when I have a problem, I need a good plan. So when they wreck the family car, they'll come home and tell you. Not try to make excuses for it or try to hide the car <laughs> uh, or afraid to come home even, some mm -hmm. kids would be. And they can walk in the door and say, um, uh, gee, we have a terribly high insurance deductible on the car, Mom. <laughs> to which I could say, talk to me about it. <laughs> because they know they're not going to get punished for what they did, but they are going to be held highly accountable. Hmm. So you, go back to discipline. Show them what they've done wrong. Did they back into something? Did somebody back into them? That's two different things. But sure. show, what did, you do? did you do anything wrong? If you didn't do anything wrong, then that's a real bummer that somebody ran into you. <laughs> but if you did do something wrong, how are you going to not speed? How are you going to look more carefully? Figure out, uh, fix what you did. Figure out how you're going to keep it from happening again. And that's pretty easily figured out. <laughs> and then give them ownership of the problem. She's got to call the insurance agent report it. She's got to deal mm -hmm. with the police. You can have to guide her. She's never wrecked the car before. <laughs> guide her. I'm also grateful nobody's hurt and all those kinds of things, sure. but she's still held highly accountable. And if there's an increase in the insurance premium, it's not out of my pocket. It's out of her money she saved. Because mm -hmm. remember, she learned from the time she was little to spend, save, or give <laughs> to those who have and give. So it all fits together. We, we need to understand that in parenting, it's the everyday stuff of life that we use. We don't need fancy programs. We don't need um, all this special time where we're going to teach our kid to be responsible. It happens yeah. in it's everyday situations. It's not situations. quality time, it's more quantity time. It's right? both. You have to do both. Sure. Um, you, and the, some of that time is hanging time, just hanging around the kids, yeah. listening to the kids, driving carpool, Letting listening. Life happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that was your first book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have two others. <laughs> Uh, your second book, Parenting Through Crisis. Yes, that was my heavy one. Death, murder, suicide, illness, divorce, step families, foster families, sperm donated families, adoption, mayhem in the community. I'm from Littleton, Colorado. We had a big mayhem. Mm. We had two young boys late siege to the high school. Yes. And, and is that what's, what spurred the, uh, no. the writing of that book? Or? No. That book I finished the day of the Columbine Massacre. Oh. I was actually on a plane delivering it to my publisher. Wow. And they asked me if I would write a chapter then on... Columbine, and I said, no. I worked with troubled kids most of my career. And I said, the reason you know so much about it, it was a suburban school, fairly affluent community, and it hit the news. We have many Columbines happening all over. And before I finished that chapter, there was Tabor, Alberta. There was Vancouver. There was Toronto, Flint, Michigan, Santee, California. Uh, it's here. It happens. Um, and what I was very curious as to looking at is how we as a community could heal reconciliatory justice. And, sure. and what I often see when kids have really messed up is we need the arm of compassion and the arm of restraint. Uh, and what I'm seeing in my country more than yours, although there's a couple of provinces that are len leaning in this direction, is we're tying the arm of compassion behind our backs and this is becoming a fist of vengeance and we'll never heal as communities. Um, but it did lead into my third book. Your third um, book being Bully, the Bullied, and the Bystander. How Parents and Teachers Can Help Break the Cycle of Violence. And it's three characters, you'll notice, those three. Um, and uh, they are three characters in a horrific tragedy. And you have to be taught to bully. It's not normal. It's not a natural not part a of growing thing. up. Uh, aggression is a part of us, and kids are going to fight. Sure. Um, when I was writing the book, what alarmed me is the anti-bullying programs in both of our countries often have as their foundation conflict resolution as a solution to bullying. And bullying is not about a conflict. It's not even about anger. 
It's about contempt for another human being that I deem unworthy um, and can be disrespectful to or I deem them inferior to me. So I can uh, do something awful to somebody I have contempt for and not even feel no any shame or compassion. Sure. That's how two young men can beat up a Matthew Shepard tie him to a fence and leave him to die. And the runner, saw, you see him in the morning, thought he was a, a skeleton, a scarecrow, until he saw the bloody tear frozen to his cheek. Now Matthew died three days later when they arrested the two boys. They said, yeah, but he was gay. As if that gives you any reason yeah. to do those horrible things. Three young boys in Texas decide they're going to have fun today. They see a black man walking down the street. He's doing nothing but walking down the street. Time to the back of the pickup and kill him. Yeah, but he was black. You know, that's contempt. That's bullying. Um, hate crimes are basically criminal bullying. And those often happen because of your race, your religion, your gender, your physical or mental ability, where somebody holds you in contempt. Hmm. And bringing it down to home, two kids fighting over a TV program, that's going to happen. Count on it. You sure. don't have to teach them. What you have to teach them is how to handle that conflict nonviolently. But you walk in, your 10-year-old has the 5-year-old's arm up the back, and the kid's screaming in pain, and you rush in there, and as soon as your daughter sees you, she drops her brother's arm and starts comforting him. <laughs> and you say, what are you screaming about? And he says, nothing, because the way I look at him, I'm his sister, it's got the arm up the back, gives him a clue, you better keep your mouth shut, <laughs> because if you don't, you're going to get it worse when Next mom or time. dad's not here, yeah. because bullying happens under the radar <laughs> adults. But back up a moment. She knew my sister. Yeah, <laughs> but back up a moment. You're the dad, and you came rushing in, and you heard that screaming. Yeah. And before I saw you, you saw me smile, because I have a smile on my face as I'm doing it. You see, bullying is taking pleasure from somebody else's pain. And it's treating them as if uh, they're worthless or inferior or undeserving of respect. And that calls for a whole different bag of tools than so, dealing with So conflict. this book must be just taking off. It must be. Uh, it's, it's done quite well here. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, that so, uh, it's done quite well. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it has. But, you know, that's a sad commentary. Yes. Uh, yes. In one way. Uh, I can't tell you the sad stories that young people have shared with me horrific things they've been exposed to in school, from an eight-year-old uh, in St. Catharines who was de-pantsed on the playground and rolled down the hill. And when he complained to his teacher, she said, oh, boys will be boys. Hmm. When a, a young girl came up to me and talked about when she was going to school, she was very poor, and the girls used to mock her because of her clothes. You know, you can be targeted just because you're new or because you wear different clothes. Or The only thing targeted kids have in common with one another is somebody targeted them. Um, and so her mother went to great lengths to save money to buy her for her birthday a beautiful leather jacket just like the other girls had. They marked all over her coat and permanent markers. So obviously with a request to write a book, uh, your, your books um, must, get, must get fairly well read by different celebrities in uh, Cities, towns, countries. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I've had a few. Yeah, yeah such yeah. as. Um, uh, I've been on Oprah, which was a gift. Well, I got to say, I was a replacement on Oprah, but I'll be a replacement hey, on that woman's show it. anytime. Um, and actually, somebody had panicked, and she called me in right away. But she, she's one of the. I've, I've seen a lot of talk show hosts, believe me, uh, <laughs> including you two. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of them match up to us? <laughs> uh, they're all different. They're okay. all different. How's I'll, that for I'll being tactful? <laughs> um, but I've got to say, of all of them, Oprah did not change her persona. She's who she is, on and off. And she's just such a, a caring person. You just felt very, very comfortable. I feel very comfortable with you. Do you? Yeah, I do. Hey, Excellent. I can gab along, and I don't know when they're going to shut me off here. Um, but uh, no, I've been on, on Oprah, and all over the world I've uh, got you, to you were meet saying because that, I've um, gone all over the world. You were saying that Trudeau called your house? Yes, years ago, many, many years ago, when he was a single parent, actually. Um, and on my tape, my little tape, um, was uh, our phone number. And uh, my mother said, uh, somebody with an accent called it. <laughs> she said it was, so my gosh, Mom. <laughs> and then she felt mortified. Oh, my. Um, and and uh, I called back, and someone had given him my tape because he was a single parent at that point. Wow. And then I began to do some work um, with the Inuktitutes up north, because Pierre Trudeau had a sure. uh, very passionate um, commitment to um, 
making better what had been rent so wrong with the mm -hmm. First Nation peoples. Well, it's quite so, a testimonial. But I've got to tell you, um, uh, the second book was dedicated to our kid's godfather, Father Martin Lawrence Jenko, who was my mentor. He married my husband and I as well, uh, and he was my husband's teacher. Uh, when he was kidnapped in Lebanon, I wrote to Reagan and Mulroney, who were in office at that point, and Jimmy Carter and, and Pierre Trudeau and Thatcher, and two people responded immediately to our pleas, Pierre Trudeau and Jimmy Carter, wow. who both had botched kidnappings during their term in office sure. with the Iranians and with the Quebec. And, and they were both so helpful to us. And, and uh, when Marty um, came back uh, from his captivity, he actually made a trip up here as a thank you. Wow, um, very nice. So uh, I'm grateful I know, I, to what he did do. Um, for for us, he's. I mean, Pierre Trudeau. Uh, you know, I don't bring his name up in Alberta very often. Uh, <laughs> so I'm an American, but I know those things. Yeah, that's probably a smart thing. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, he was far better known outside of this country as a peacemaker. Wow. Uh, just as Canadians, uh, and I say this as an American, uh, when my kids travel, they wear Canadian backpacks. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, for lots of reasons, but they also feel like this is part of their. T but you are known throughout the world as peacemakers, Excellent. and as people that stand up and speak out when the burden's heavy, and uh, that is so important. Um, especially right now. Especially right now, <laughs> uh, because one of the things we have to recognize is when you make a stand on principle that it's often with a heavy burden. Hmm. And you must be willing to take that burden and not back down when the, the burden starts getting heavy or very. It has been lately. It has. Yes. Hmm. It has. And I would have to say, part of what's real offensive to me, and I wrote about it in my bullying book, actually, is um, that when we demean another human being, um, that's bullying, uh, that we need to address the deed somebody's doing and not the person, the person and with ugly names, sure. which you probably all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, when it, it's so juvenile and immature to be name calling people or threatening people, what we have to do is say it's okay to have a difference of conviction, not opinion. Yes. When it's this big a deal, it's got to be of conviction. But having that difference, we still must treat one another with dignity and regard. Um, and stand for a principle we feel very firmly about, as you know, and I shared with you, I'm very, very much opposed to this war. Um, and I feel very strongly uh, that no matter what the burden is, that we have to speak out. And, but I will still carry on a dialogue. I, I worked at Fort Carson last Thursday with young men and women being shipped out and uh, spoke with them. Um, and s some of them were very much opposed to this war not to war in general is as, because they're, they're in the service. But, um, but I also had to be able to talk to people who felt very strongly about it. And when I talked to them, I said, because we were talking about bullying as well as loss, because um, they're dealing with some major loss in deployment, uh, I said, you know what, when we have a difference of conviction, we still must treat one another as human beings. That's the three things. Act with integrity, so you can have a conviction that's different than mine, but we both have to act with civility. Yes. We have to be civil human beings to one another. I don't have to like you, but we have to be civil. And then treat one another with compassion. Hmm. Barb, thank you very much for, for coming on our show. We're Thanks we're for so having happy me. to have you here. And, um, we also have to pay our bills right now. We want to thank our, our sponsors, uh, uh, Zares and The Brick and T. Hen Home Hardware Building Center. And uh, we want to thank the infamous Barbara Coloroso for uh, appearing on our show and um, talking about your books. And hopefully you will it's been a pleasure. be back in the area very soon and we will definitely yeah. have you back on. I'm happy to come. Well, yeah. Thank you very and thank much. You thank you, too. Barb. Yes, it's a pleasure. For John Hollingsworth and Dave Paul and our special guest, Barbara, Thanks for watching Six in the City. We'll talk to you later. Six in the City was taped before a live studio audience arrived. No animals were harmed in the production of this show. Sound assembly required, batteries not included, on approved credit. Six in the City was a presentation of your community channel, Kojiko TV6, where your community matters.